In 2022, Senator Josh Hawley repeatedly clashed with Senator Dick Durbin, the Democratic chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Hawley, a hardline Missouri Republican, did not shy away from controversy or direct confrontation, and Durbin often refused to take it. Their skirmishes occurred across a range of hearings as well as on the Senate floor itself. Hawley's fiery objections and disagreements with Durbin often made news or went viral on social media. Some critics accused Hawley of deliberately engaging in conflict in order to bolster his political brand with conservatives. At large, you may wonder why we're spending so much time talking about this inside baseball issue, about blue slips. Uh, Mr. Mathis, it is your good fortune to be the first circuit court nominee before us, I believe, since President Biden was elected uh, from a state with two Republican senators. So we're kind of testing the waters here about what we're experiencing and what we hope to experience in the future. And so we're not just carping on a trifle. These really get down to basic fundamental questions about the selection process for lifetime appointments to the highest courts in the land. So it, it, this is not just political bickering. Uh, we are trying, and I believe Senator Kennedy made a positive contribution to the conversation earlier. We're trying to find some common ground, and I hope we can, ultimately. The only other point I would raise in uh, recognizing Senator Hawley is that uh, each one of these nominees goes before the American Bar Association, which sets up a committee which surveys the attorneys and judges in the jurisdictions that they practice law and asks some fundamental questions about temperament, knowledge, experience, trustworthiness, on and on. And then they give us a grade. The grade that was given to Mr. Mathis is the highest possible unanimously well qualified. So when people are raising questions about his experience and background, uh, his peers and those who appeared before him and those who appeared before uh, have come down with their unanimously well qualified rating. Senator Hawley, I believe you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations, Mr. Mathis, on your nomination. Um, I want to start by, by uh, adding my voice uh, in support of, of Senator Blackburn and Senator Haggerty and uh, saying that uh, I hope that the process has been followed in this nomination will never be the process again. But I also want to point out that this seems to be a more systemic issue in the sense that uh, Senator Sullivan, who's not a member of this committee, as the chairman knows, Senator Sullivan, Malaska, has been unable to meet with any Ninth Circuit nominee who would be judging cases from his state for the entire past year he has asked repeatedly to sit down with Ninth Circuit nominees. He's not a member of this committee. He doesn't have the benefit of being able to ask questions here before we vote on him. He'd like to meet with them. And as of December, for months on end, he was unable to just ask questions of the nominees. And for that reason, has been, has been uh, voting no on nominees he might otherwise be willing to support or at least to consider. And uh, I just don't understand it. I don't understand why. Uh, it's not possible why this White House is, is, is denying senators the ability to meet with nominees, engaging in basic consultation. I don't get it. Uh, I, I guess it's just a uh, no-holds-barred, uh, burn-all-before-you strategy. But I have to say, I, I think it's one that's going to backfire, and, and I, I think it's unfortunate. Mr. Mathis, that really doesn't have anything to do with you personally, so I'm sorry that you've had to sit through all of this because it's really not about – you, but uh, it, I agree with the chairman to the extent that uh, I think these are important issues, and and I hope ones that we can get resolved. But let me ask you some questions about your own your own record. Let me ask you about a, a 2007 law review article. Were you in, like to in, respond to a statement that you made earlier about Senator Sullivan, uh, Republican senator from Alaska? He came to me, and he believed that since Alaska is fairly unique in the Ninth Circuit, that he uh, wanted to meet with the nominees for the Ninth Circuit. I checked into it, and there is a mixed record as to whether nominees are make, make themselves available to individual senators. But I thought his was a legitimate and good faith effort to, as he said, I, I've only got two or three cases relating to Alaska. I want to at least tell him what they are. Senator Murkowski agreed with him. I believed it was a good faith request, and I went to the White House, and he did meet with two Ninth, Court, Ninth Circuit nominees as a result of it. I'll offer the same uh, support to any member of the committee who is not in the interest of delaying anything, but in 
genuine interest of knowing where they stand on cases that are relevant to their states. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad you intervened in that respect. And I, I, I think your last point is an important one that, that Senator Sullivan wasn't trying to delay anything, but it's a very, and he's not a member of the committee. He didn't have, he didn't have the ability to ask questions, but I, I just regret, I mean, my, make my point again, I regret that you might remember that Senator Sullivan went to the floor and blocked a number of nominees and yes, voted no, and he had to do all of that in order to get the attention of the White House. And I thank you for your good offices, but you know, I mean, it really shouldn't come to that. And I see this, this, this situation is similar. I mean, that Senator Blackburn, and Senator Haggerty have, have had to, to just say, listen, this is really wrong and point out that they haven't been afforded basic consultation rights. And that really shouldn't be necessary, but thank you for your good offices in that circumstance. You're welcome. I believe Senator Padilla is waiting to join us virtually. Senator, are you? To, to help judges who are looking at these cases to be able to rely on the guidelines. Which Congress has declined to do. Senator, in that case, we have the statute that Congress has enacted concerning penalties, and we have judges who are doing their level best to make sure that people are held accountable as they need to be in our society in a fair and just way. Mr. Chairman, I have, my time's expired. I have, thank you, Judge. Uh, I have no further questions at this time. Just checking with my staff. So the original statute was passed in 2003, the Scalia decision, 2005, the Booker decision. So the original statute that I'm talking about, um, I'm just thinking, was I felt like it was in the 80s. We think it, there may in have been. In 2003, 2003, I'm. 2003. I'm all right, and, the and decision then by, uh, Justice Scalia, yeah. the Booker decision made the guidelines advisory so that even though judges have to calculate them, they are no longer binding. And what it meant in the statute is that the guidelines became one factor among many that judges consider at sentencing. I'm not going to opine on Justice Scalia and his conduct decision as it relates to the overall topic. I hope we all agree that we want to do everything in our power, reasonably within our power, to lessen the incidence of pornography and exploitation of children. You have made that clear. That is your position, too. But I just want to tell you, Congress has, doesn't have clean hands in this conversation. We haven't touched this now for 15, 16, or 17 years. And this you aren't the only one who faced this kind of a challenge with the cases before you. I said this morning, and it bears repeating, in United States versus Klotz, Trump appointed Judge Sarah Pitlick, Hawley's choice, Senator Hawley's choice for the Eastern District of Missouri, sentenced an individual convicted of possession of child pornography to only 60 months, well below the 135 to 168 month sentence recommended by the guidelines. Mr. Chairman, you've mentioned uh, this Let me now. finish. Uh, I'll finish, and then I'll, of course I'll recognize okay. you. Senator Hawley, you've said some very powerful things in support of this judge, but clearly she faced a situation where she decided she would not follow the guidelines and took a sentence of less than half of what they recommended. We have created a situation because of our inattention and unwillingness to tackle an extremely controversial area in Congress and left it to the judges. And I think we have to accept some responsibility for that, Senator. I just wanted to say, uh, Chairman Durbin, since you mentioned Judge Pitlick in the Klotz case, uh, she followed the, the prosecutor's recommendation in that case. My, as I've said over and over, part of my concern with Judge Jackson is that she has not followed the prosecutor's sentences. She didn't in the Hawkins case we were just talking about or the guidelines. And uh, I'm happy we'll, we can have a policy debate about whether or not the guidelines are too lenient. I would argue in this era of exploding child pornography, they're not too lenient at all. I think you were right the first time when you voted in 2003 to make them tougher. I will just say that uh, I don't know if you sponsored a bill to change this. I'll be looking for it. But I will tell you that there isn't a long line of people waiting to co-sponsor this controversial issue. We, if we're going to tackle it, we should. But we should concede in the meantime that we've left judges in the lurch in many of these situations. There is no clarity in this situation, and I think to hold this judge responsible for the overall situation is to ignore our nonfeasance, malfeasance, whatever it might be, and lack of responsibility in dealing with this. Senator Hirono. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President. Senator from Missouri. Mr. President, I rise today to urge the Senate to take action to crack down on child pornography offenders and to protect our children. This is a growing crisis, and it is one that is near to the heart of every parent in America. I can attest to that as a father of three small children myself. I've got a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a 16-month-old baby at home. But I can also attest to it as a former prosecutor, as the Attorney General for the State of Missouri, one of the first things I did was to establish a statewide anti-human trafficking initiative and task force, because what I saw as Attorney General of my state was that human trafficking, including, unfortunately, child sex trafficking, is an exploding epidemic in my state and around our country. Children are exploited, children are trafficked, and those who work in this area, those who prosecute in this area, law enforcement, who work day in and day out, will tell you that the explosion of child pornography is helping to drive this exploding epidemic of child sexual exploitation and child sex trafficking. The problem is, is that child porn itself is exploding. A New York Times investigative report found that in 2018, there were 45 million images of children being sexually exploited available on the internet. 45 million. Just a few years before, it had been 3 million. In 2018, 45. Then last year, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children found that that number had grown to 85 million. 85 million images on the internet of children being brutally sexually exploited. And as every prosecutor and every law enforcement advocate and every law enforcement agent who works in this area will tell you, that explosion of this material, which by the way is harmful in and of itself, is exploitative in and of itself, is driving a crisis of child exploitation and child sex trafficking in this country. Now, the nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court has helped bring this issue front and center. Her record of leniency to child sex offenders has been much the center of her hearings, and it has startled the public. A recent Rasmussen survey found that following her hearings, 56% 56, 56 of all respondents said that they were troubled by her record on child sex offenders. That included 64% of independents, and their right to be troubled. Her record is indeed startling. In every case involving child pornography where she had discretion, she sentenced below the federal sentencing guidelines, below the prosecutor's recommendations, and below the national averages. We now know that the national average for possession of child pornography, the national sentence imposed on average, is 68 months. Judge Jackson's average, 29.3 months. The national average sentence for distribution of child pornography 135 months. Judge Jackson's average, 71.9 months. In fact, it's true for criminal sentencing across the board. The national average of all criminal sentences imposed in the United States, 45 months. Judge Jackson's average, 29.9 months. This is a record of leniency, in the words of the Republican leader, leniency to the extreme to child sex offenders, and on criminal matters in general. But, 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 we are told, and have been told for weeks on end now, it's not really her fault. We were told by the White House and Senate Democrats that it's not her fault because those federal sentencing guidelines that she, in every case where she could, went below, those guidelines aren't binding. Thanks to a decision of the Supreme Court by Justice Breyer, Justice Stevens, those guidelines are only advisory. And so we were told repeatedly that if we really want to get tougher sentences for child porn offenders, that we're going to have to change the law. In fact, I, I see my friend Senator Durbin here today, 
the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, he said this to me multiple times during the committee. On March the 22nd, he said to me, I hope we will all agree that we want to do everything in our power to lessen the incidence of pornography and exploitation of children. I want to tell you, Congress doesn't have clean hands. We haven't touched this now for 15, 16, or 17 years. Senator Durbin went on, we've created a situation because of our inattention and unwillingness to tackle an extremely controversial area in Congress and left it to the judges. I think we have to accept some responsibility. And he went on, I don't know if you, meaning me, have sponsored a bill to change this. I'll be looking for it. If we're going to tackle it, we should. Well, I agree with that, 100%. I agree we should tackle it. This is the time to tackle it, and I'm here to do that today. I'm proud to sponsor and introduce legislation along with my fellow senators Mike Lee and Tom Tillis and Rick Scott and Ted Cruz to get tough on child porn offenders. Now, let's be clear. When Congress wrote the Child Pornography Federal Sentencing Guidelines, and it is Congress that wrote them substantially way back in 2003, when Congress wrote them, they wanted them to be binding. Congress meant for these guidelines to bind federal judges. The Supreme Court struck that part of the guidelines down. Now it's time to put it back into place. My bill would create a new mandatory, mandatory minimum sentence of five years for every child porn offender who possesses pornography. Five years. If you do this crime, you ought to go to jail. It would make the guidelines binding for any and all facts that are found by a jury or found by a judge in a trial. Restore the law to what Congress intended back in 2003. Take away discretion from judges to be soft on crime and get tough on child sex offenders. That's what this bill would do. Now, I've called this bill the Protect Act of 2022 because it's modeled on the Protect Act of 2003 when Congress wrote these guidelines. And I just note for the record that I believe every senator voted for it back in 2003 including the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Senator Durbin, and every member of the Judiciary Committee, Republican and Democrat, who was serving at the time. That act back in 2003 toughened penalties for child porn offenders, made the guidelines mandatory, and explicitly took away discretion from judges to sentence below the guidelines. I, I think it was a pretty good law, and I think now is the time to act. Our children are at risk. The epidemic of sexual assault, sexual exploitation, and victimization is real. And let's be clear on what child pornography is. It is an industry, an industry that feeds on the exploitation of the most vulnerable members of our society, that feeds on the spectator sport of child abuse and child victimization. If you have a lot of images of child pornography, you ought to go to jail for a long time. If you possess child pornography, you ought to go to jail for at least five years. And yes, it is time to tell every judge in America to get tough on child porn. That's what this bill would do. And I just urge the Senate now to take this opportunity to act. And so as if in legislative session, I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on the Judiciary be discharged from further consideration of S-3951 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. I further ask that the bill be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Mr. President. Majority whip. Reserving the right to object. I have to ask myself, why now? Why does the junior senator from Missouri bring this bill to the floor of the United States Senate today? When you think back, this matter has been considered Originally, the guidelines were considered in 1984. The question of child pornography came back to us in 2003. In 2005, there was a Supreme Court case about applying the guidelines on sentencing to these types of cases, a case known as Booker. We know that in 2005, that decision was handed down. We know in 2012, the Sentencing Commission said to Congress and to the world, you need to do something here. These guidelines that you promulgated don't reflect the reality of today. We know as well that uh, the guidelines were written, some were written in an era when the materials we're talking about were physical materials, and we now live in a world of internet, 
and access to not just tens and hundreds, but thousands of images, if that is your decision. And all these things have happened, and we come here today. Today. I don't know exactly how many years the senator from Missouri has been in the Senate, but to my knowledge, this is his first bill on this subject that he has presented in the last few weeks. And I wonder why. Why now? Are there valid questions about sentencing guidelines? Certainly. There's no question about it. I said as much, and he quoted me. The Sentencing Commission told us over a decade ago, in 2012, you've got a problem here. The world has changed, and the law doesn't reflect it. But this is the first time, to my knowledge, that the senator from Missouri, or any Republican senator, has tried to enact legislation on the subject. Why now? Well, I know why. He said as much. It's because we are now considering the nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court. And this senator has suggested over the course of the last two weeks in hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee that somehow this judge, this judge aspiring to the Supreme Court is out of the mainstream when it comes to sentencing in child pornography cases. It's no coincidence that the senator from Missouri comes to the floor today while Judge Jackson's nomination is pending on the Senate calendar and has been discharged from our committee by a bipartisan vote of the Senate last night. It's no coincidence that he is raising this issue within hours or days before her confirmation vote. It's one more very transparent attempt to link Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation with this highly emotional issue of federal sentencing when it comes to child pornography or child exploitation. There are some political groups, at least one well-known political group, that manufactures theories about child porn pornography and pedophilia and the like, and even inspires deadly reactions to them, and they're cheering this on. I've seen their reaction already this morning in the newspaper. They're watching this and hoping that someone can keep this issue alive on the floor of the United States Senate for them. The senator from Missouri has even gone so far as to make the outrageous claim that this woman, Judge Jackson, the mother of two wonderful girls who I had a chance to meet, a mother who comes to this issue not only as a judge, but as the daughter and niece of law enforcement officials who've been part of her family, in the words of the senator from Missouri, that this woman, quote, endangers children, close quote. Endangers children. I'll yield when I'm finished. One conservative former prosecutor called Senator Hawley's charges, quote, meritless to the point of demagoguery. I've read so many reviews of the senator's charges against this judicial nominee. Not one of them gives him any credence. They basically say what you are dealing with here is a complicated area of the law, controversial area of the law, and to try to ascribe to this one nominee these motives, these outcomes, is baseless and meritless. Consider this. How can this judicial nominee possibly have the endorsement of the largest law enforcement organization in America, the Fraternal Order of Police, the endorsement of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and many other law enforcement groups? How could she possibly have all that and be as wrong on a critical issue as the senator from Missouri has asserted? How, could, how is it possible that the American Bar Association took a look at all of her contacts as a judge, as a lawyer, as a law student, came up with 250 individuals who knew her personally, appeared in court with and against her, judged her in her individual capacity as a lawyer. How can the American Bar Association interview those 250 and find no evidence of the charges that have been made by the senator from Missouri? How is it possible that they would review all this and miss such a glaring fact? They didn't. They told us under oath 
that they asked point blank. Is her sentencing standard soft on crime, different than other judges? The answer was no, no. And the net result of it was the American Bar Association found this nominee, whom the senator from Missouri charges with these outrageous claims, they found her to be unanimously well qualified, unanimously well qualified. And yet the senator from Missouri believes that he's discovered something that the whole world's missed. Unfortunately, he's wrong, and he doesn't admit it. When Judge Jackson is confirmed to the Supreme Court, and I pray that she will be later this week, it will be in part because she is a thoughtful, dedicated person who has worked as a judge for over 10 years. She has published almost 600 written opinions. She has had 100 cases where she has imposed criminal sentences and a dozen or plus cases involving children. What the senator from Missouri has done is cherry pick arguments from one small part of her service on the bench that has been debunked across the board. But let me say it again. Judge Jackson's sentences were appropriate exercises of discretion as a judge applying the law to the facts in difficult cases. And it's interesting to me how the senator from Missouri has carefully drawn lines to exclude Trump appointees to the bench who've done exactly what this judge has done as well, so-called deviate from the guidelines when it came to sentencing. In fact, one judge from his state, from the Eastern District of Missouri, whom he has personally endorsed as a good judge and may well be, has followed the same practice as this judge. Did he raise that at all in the Senate Judiciary Committee about the Missouri judge that was doing the same thing as Judge Jackson? No, nothing. There is nothing about these judges that is deviating from other than accept, accepted practices. When 70 to 80 percent of the judges across America are using the same standard, Judge Jackson is in that mainstream, along with judges that this senator from Missouri has endorsed. If this issue needs to be addressed, and I believe it does, we can do so if we do it carefully, and we should do it carefully. Make no mistake, I, I don't back off from my words. As a father, as a grandfather, as a caring parent, I sincerely consider this to be one of the most serious crimes, the exploitation of children. I can't think of anything worse. And the pornography issue certainly is out of control because of the internet and because of those who are making a dollar on it. And we should take it very seriously, very seriously. It changes and destroys lives. But let's make sure we do this in the right way. What have we done on the Senate Judiciary Committee? It's great for the chairman to stand on the Senate floor and talk about the issue. Well, what have you done, Senator? Well, let me tell you what I've done, and I think the Senator from Missouri knows it. We've done what we can to address this issue from many different angles. The committee held a hearing on the FBI's failure to properly investigate allegations against Larry Nassar for assaulting young athletes, Olympic gymnasts included, it, which enabled the abuse of dozens of additional victims. We called them on the carpet, we put them under oath, we brought the testimony forward. We didn't back away from the issue of child abuse. Following that hearing, I introduced the Eliminating Limits to Justice for Child Sex Abuse Victims Act with Senator Marsha Blackburn, a Republican from Tennessee. The Senate has now passed this bipartisan legislation which would enable survivors of child sex abuse to seek civil damages in federal court no matter how long it's taken the survivor to disclose the facts of the case. And the committee has unanimously reported a bill which the Senator from Missouri knows well, the Earn It Act, legislation he has co-sponsored with Democratic Senator Blumenthal that will remove blanket immunity for the tech industry for violations of laws relating to online child sex abuse material. I have no apologies for our approach on this, and there is more work to be done. But I want to tell you, I'm tempted to leave it just at that, but for one part, one thing I'm concerned about. Our federal sentencing guidelines have been advisory, not mandatory, since the Supreme Court's 2005 ruling in the Booker case. This bill, now being offered on the floor in a, in a very quick fashion by the Senator from Missouri, this bill attempts to create mandatory sentencing guidelines for a single category of offense. It's not clear whether it passes the constitutional test of Booker. It could be a waste of time. 
we don't need to waste time in a critical area of the law that has been so controversial and has been considered and reviewed over decades. Even so, it's a dangerous slope to go down. Imagine a world where every time it was politically advantageous, whether there was a Supreme Court nominee or a headline in the paper, that some senator could come forward, disagree with a federal judge on a particular case, and say, let's pass a mandatory minimum sentencing guideline to take care of the matter. That is no way to approach the law in a fashion that is used for deterrence and punishment. We need to be thoughtful about it. A subject of this seriousness, this gravity, deserves more than a drive-by on the floor of the United States Senate. I invite my colleague to do his work on this issue, as we all should, the work that is required, the work that is required by the seriousness of this matter, and I object. Mr. President. Objection is heard. Mr. President. Senator from Missouri. The Senator asks why now, why act now, because it's a crisis now because there are 85 million images of children being exploited on the internet now, because child exploitation is exploding in this country now. And today the senator lays bare on this floor the bait and switch that he and his colleagues have employed. They say, oh, Judge Jackson, it's not her fault. You should act in the law to change the law. But when we come to change the law and to do what this Congress did in 2003, to do it now in 2022, a measure that Senator Durbin supported in 2003, he says, oh, no, no, we don't need to act now. Why do it's rushed? It's too hurried. Let's do it later. Let's think about it longer. And then we hear recited again the bizarre claims that somehow child pornography is a conspiracy theory. This is something that the Senate Democrats, including the chairman, have repeated over and over and over, led by the White House. The idea that child exploitation is a conspiracy theory? I just invite you to look any parent in America in the eye and tell them that the exploitation of children is a conspiracy theory, or any law enforcement agent, or any prosecutor, or anyone who is working on the exploitation to combat the exploitation of children in this country. No, it's a crisis, and it's real. And the fact that the Senate hasn't acted till now is, I think, shameful for the Senate. But why wait another day? Now, I look forward, if the Senator is serious, he does hold the gavel on the Judiciary Committee, we could mark this bill up. We could hold hearings. We could take action. I'd invite him to co-sponsor this bill. He voted for it in 2003. Let's have hearings then, if we can't vote on it today, if we can't debate it today. Let's have hearings. Let's mark it up. Let's take it seriously. I'll wait. I suspect I'll be waiting for an awfully long time. Here's the bottom line. I am not willing to tell the parents of my state that I sat by and did nothing. I am not willing to dismiss child exploitation as just some conspiracy theory. I am not willing to abandon the victims of this crime to their own devices and say, good luck to you. No, I'm not willing to do that. And nor am I willing to excuse Judge Jackson's record of leniency that does need to be corrected. She should not have had the discretion to sentence leniently in the extreme as she did, nor should any judge in America, in my view. So what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. We should fix it for everybody across the board. And we can begin by acting as we did in 2003. So I'm disappointed, but I can't say that I'm surprised that this measure has been objected to today. And all I can say is I pledge to my constituents, I pledge to the parents of my state, and yes, to the victims of my state, that I will continue to come to this floor, that I will continue to seek passage of this act until we get action from this Senate to protect children and to punish child pornographers. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Majority Lee. So after 27, 27 minutes of debate on the floor of the Senate, uh, the Senator now believes we're prepared to change the law that has been debated for decades. He has put in a bill introduced seven days ago. It's been seven days he's had the passion for this issue, enough to introduce legislation. If you want to take on a serious issue, take it on seriously. And that means doing the homework on it. Yes, have a hearing. Of course have a hearing. We want to make sure that people from the Sentencing Commission and others are part of this conversation. It isn't just a matter of throwing charges out against a nominee. 
And if you want to be serious about it, then admit the obvious. 70 to 80 percent of federal judges struggle with the same sentencing that we have set down in, in light of Supreme Court decisions. We understand that. Uh, ask for order, Mr. President. Ask for order. Um, there was no response to begin with uh, to the senator, so uh, let's uh, move forward. So I would say, Mr. President, that as far as I am concerned, this is a serious matter that should be taken seriously. You don't become an expert by seven days ago introducing a bill and say, I've got it. Don't change a word of it. Make it the law of the land. Make it apply to every court in the land. No, we're going to do this seriously. We're going to do it the right way. And we're going to tackle an issue that has been avoided for more than two decades when you look at the history of it. I find this reprehensible, the pornography, the sex exploitation of children. There are no excuses whatsoever. But I'm not going to do this in a slipshod, make a headline manner. We're going to do it in a manner that is serious, that we work with prosecutors, defenders, judges, sentencing commission, and get it right. It's time to get it right. We wrote this law some 19 years ago before the internet was as prevalent in society as it is today. Let us be mindful of that as we attack this problem and address it in a fashion that is befitting the Senate and the Senate Judiciary Committee. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Missouri. Mr. President, the Senator from Illinois says that Congress hasn't acted in two decades. That's true. I haven't been here for two decades. He has. There is no excuse to not take action now. There is no excuse to not act on this problem when we know what the solution is. So listen, if the senator is saying today, if he's committing today to holding hearings and marking up a bill to toughen the child pornography laws, to make mandatory the sentencing guidelines, that's fantastic. I'll take him at his word. I look forward to seeing those hearings noticed and to seeing that markup noticed. And I hope it'll be forthcoming. I'm here to make a prediction. I think we'll be waiting a very long time. Because let's not forget what his party and the sentencing commission, stacked with members of his party, have been recommending. It's not been to make child sentences tougher, child pornography sentences tougher. They have wanted to make them weaker. What the sentencing commission has recommended with its liberal members for years now is to make them weaker. That's what Judge Jackson has advocated. She also wants to change the guidelines to make them weaker. I think that's exactly the wrong move. And that's why the senator was here to block this effort today. He doesn't want to see tougher sentences. He doesn't want to talk about this issue. He wants to sweep it under the rug. I'm here to say I won't let that happen. I'll be here as long as it takes. I'll be agitating for this in the Senate Judiciary Committee as long as it takes until we get justice for the victims of child pornography and child exploitation. I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the Senate stands in recess until 2.15 p.m. Rape? I mean, for which there ought to be a mandatory minimum, because you said earlier there shouldn't be. I'm astounded by that. Thank you, Senator. If I'm confirmed, I'd like to make an informed recommendation on that after consulting How am I going to make an informed judgment on voting for you if you won't tell me what your positions are? I don't know if you changed them or not. It sounds like you have changed them. You signed a letter. You, you took very, frankly, radical policy positions, and now you won't answer me. What am I to draw from that? Senator, I, I hope that what you draw is that I'm open to listening to this diverse group No, I, of I think people. what I draw from it is, is that you don't want to answer my questions because the positions that you took were radical and frankly, I, I think wrong. And, and in light of the dangers that children and people all over this country are facing, I, I think deeply, deeply wrongheaded. I can't possibly support your nomination. I can't support the nomination of someone who wants to do away with mandatory minimums. I think it's a radical position, and I think, frankly, your nomination is indicative of where this administration is on its soft on crime policies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The questioning by Senator Hawley may sound reminiscent of his questioning of the Supreme Court nominee, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Uh, and we know his position. We also know uh, his approach to questioning about this issue. Uh, I might call to his attention, and I hope he has read carefully, the report of the Sentencing Commission on this topic. Uh, it suggests that we have a responsibility in Congress to do something, having waited for years and not responded to changing circumstances for this horrible crime. Uh, we need to do this in a thoughtful way, and I hope we will. And indeed, Mr. Chairman, you may recall that I've introduced legislation to do that, which you personally blocked. Listen to how he did it. brought it to the floor, take it or leave it. This is an issue that is serious, and we ought to treat it seriously, which means we deal with our responsibility as a committee. 
not to jam it through on a take it or leave it. Well, I look forward to you marking it up then. Well, I look forward to you suggesting some alternatives other than just put everybody in jail. There's got ah. to be a better approach. Right. Let them all out. No, of course not. And that's, that's the kind of conversation we have here, unfortunately, instead of getting down to the serious business. I would recommend uh, the introduction to the Sentencing Commission uh, report of a year ago, uh, which acknowledges the obvious. Child pornography offenses have grown substantially. There's a steady increase in the percentage of sentences imposed below the applicable guideline. Over 60% of the judges have said that the guideline does not reflect reality. And third, the volume and accessibility of child pornography Im images has increased dramatically. This is a serious, horrible crime. We need to treat it as such, and we need to treat the topic as a serious undertaking by this committee, not drive by questioning and suggestions on the floor of the United States Senate. Senator Ossoff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to the nominees. Uh, it's uh, an honor. Appreciate all the service you've all rendered to the country already, and uh, thank you for uh, sitting before the committee today. Um, Ms. Wong, if you would please, what in your view is the purpose of punishment? Certainly, Senator Kennedy. Mr. Chairman, I think you mischaracterized my questions. Oh, no, sir, I wasn't referring to you at all. I'm glad to hear that because my questions of the judge were, and I never got an answer, did she agree or disagree with the recommendations? Senator, I was not referring to you at all. You've asked that question, and most nominees have given the same answer as these nominees, but it's your right to ask that question. And so I was referring to this so-called report involving the Supreme Court. I was too. And, and if, we, if you have a second round, I'm going to ask it again. Well, there's does no, the, plan, no does plan. The, does the judge agree or disagree with the recommendations? Senator, I'm not really interested in how many lawyers can dance on the head of a pen. Senator, I'm just interested in getting, hearing whether the judge agrees or disagrees. Senator, you're doing the same thing that we've done when the tables were turned. Try to get these nominees to say what their personal views are, and most of them think it through and believe that they can't do that, and it, it makes them sound as if they don't have a personal well, view. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that's the purpose of the Judiciary Committee. Well, you're committee. entitled to your you, opinion. You're, let me just finish my thought, and I'm entitled to my opinion. I mean, we're confirming these nominees for lifetime appointments. They're not elected. You don't think it's relevant what they believe? I think you create a, uh, a problem for them that jeopardizes uh, their role as judges. And when I just they, ask them what well, they believe? May I finish my thought? Certainly, I apologize. Okay, thank you very much. I think that they understand that if they start expressing their personal views, as Ms. Chung has said repeatedly, it's a forecast of the future, and they're trying their best to say law, facts, precedent, and stick with it, and I think that's what we expect of judges. Well, I, I just disagree, Mr. Chairman. I think people's per, personal beliefs, have they thought about the world? Have they thought about the issues that are, that are central to American democracy? I think, that, I think that's perfectly appropriate. I'm surprised that, that, that no, and this isn't meant to be personal, but, but that you haven't directed them, the, the witnesses to answer our questions. We asked the same question to Trump nominees and got the same response. This is a predictable course of action on this committee. We try to probe as deeply as we can, and witnesses don't always go along with the extent of our probe. Well, recently they never do. Well, under Trump's nominees, they never did either. Well, I questioned them too, as you recall. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I just, uh, since I think that last back and forth was directed implicitly at me, I, th I think you factually misstated the, the record, though. With well, and maybe get, I'm wrong. Let's get this straight, well, because I... Well, can I just, let me... He, yeah, sure. so here's, I, th I think, man, maybe I'm wrong about this. I thought that the justice was the co-chair of this diversity strategic planning steering committee, and that entity issued a report to the Delaware Supreme Court. You said that some group made recommendations to the justice. I, I, don't, I don't think that's right. I think she co-chaired a committee that made recommendations to the Delaware Supreme Court, and her testimony's been the Supreme Court hasn't acted on those recommendations. Let her, let her respond. Sure. 
Uh, it is correct that I'm the co-chair of the committee that made the recommendations, but what I was trying to clarify is that there's a subgroup, there are five subgroups that made recommendations. During those, uh, during those deliberations, the, the uh, co-chairs, myself and the Chief Justice, did not make recommendations. We did not uh, identify specific recommendations for people. We didn't strike down recommendations for people. We didn't say, yes, we like those, no, we don't like the, that like the other ones. We allowed the, the subcommittees to create their own recommendations. We didn't change the recommendations at all as they went into the report. And those recommendations went in as is to the Supreme Court. And as a, the entire Supreme Court, our analysis as uh, the Chief Justice and myself would be with the rest of the Supreme Court. Understood. My, my, only, my only point, Mr. Chairman, is, and I think what I heard Senator Cruz's question, I can't speak for him, I'll just speak for myself. My point is, is that the Justice co-chair of the panel, I think it's, I think it's reasonable to ask her about the, the, the content of the report that they made. That's my, that, and if she doesn't want to answer the questions per your exchange with Senator Kennedy, that's Suggest, fine. The suggestion is she's dodging the question, how much more explicit can she be? The presumption seems to be that she wrote the recommendations and it's clear she did not. And she said it repeatedly and you won't accept it. That's just a fact. And so I, it is an unusual situation, but best I can determine, she gathered the information and passed it along without a vote of approval or without any scrutiny but, on her person. But Mr. Person. Chairman, I, I just respectfully uh, disagree. I don't think, that's not what I asked the, the, the witness. I asked her, did she agree, did she agree or disagree with the recommendations? Well, Forget that, that, the report. That's another question, Senator. But I never got an answer. Oh, no, and I don't think you would have from a Trump nominee either. But we don't have Trump. I, I, I pressed a lot of Trump nominees, as you well know, and voted against a bunch of them. And they helped kill four or five that I didn't think were qualified. But I, I don't agree with your revisionist history, no disrespect, in the last 10 minutes. I asked the witness four or five times, do you agree or disagree? And I didn't get an answer. Now, you can call that dodging the question. Uh, if you want to, that's a little pejorative to me, but I never got an answer, and I don't think that's inappropriate for me to ask. That's the issue. Senator, uh, by virtue of your position on the committee, you're entitled to ask what you wish, and I'm glad you had that chance. If there's nothing further to come before this panel, I want to thank both of you uh, for joining us this morning, uh, and uh, our committee will take up your nominations uh, at a later date. If you receive questions in writing, please respond to them promptly we, uh, so we can move this along.